on this episode, Christian wants more. Look at the stuff, isn't it neat? But don't believe his lies. It will make sense, don't worry. It will make sense. Numbers seem to have gotten to his head. It worked. I am a genius. Mm. <sighs> Hi everybody, this is Christian, this is Lasers Academy. This is the advanced shmup tutorial and we are making an editor. We are making an editor, is what I said. We are making a thing where we can edit a bunch of numbers in Pico 8 and turn them into magic. Um, so previously, in the pre previous two episodes, we dealt with uh, importing a two-dimensional table, two-dimensional array into our editor and exporting it. We focus on an I.O. input and output. Today, something I want to focus on is the actual UI of the editor. And as we said in the previous episodes, I want to kind of basically recreate Excel, uh, a spreadsheet program. I just want to have like a spreadsheet program Pico 8, which is not the wisest thing because I could also just use Excel. And in fact, a lot of people do. A lot of game designers do use Excel to edit the data for their programs because my, most of the time it's fine. Like it's, it does the job. And it's, it, it's, you know, it's, Excel is kind of like the Swiss army knife for modifying all sorts of various data, right? And so, yeah, most of the time you can use Excel. Um, there's a couple of situations where you can't use Excel where, or where Excel doesn't really help you that much. And the situation that we're in right now is kind of like those, those kind of things. We are um, about to create an editor for sprites, for PQ8 sprites. And it's difficult to make Excel, you know, show us the actual sprites that we're editing. So that's why we kind of have to recreate it in Pico 8 so Pico 8 can show us the sprites. But before we get there, before we get there, I want to kind of have like some basic, like very generic functionality to edit these kinds of like two-dimensional array. So again, I want to kind of recreate Excel. Now, one core concept that we already kind of established is like having like these little black boxes with the text written in it. That's something I want to continue. Something I want to establish today is I want to make those, do a bit of a layout tweaking, you know, and make sure that they can look nice. But also I want to um, set up a system where I can start um, going with a cursor through these. You know, I can move a cursor and select a cell. And then we're going to think about what else we can do with that cell. But first, setting setting up a kind of like a UI system that we can then maybe re reuse for other UIs, right? And this is kind of something. There's like so many ways of doing this, so many ways of doing this. And uh, the way I'm going to use is a bit weird, not intuitive, not necessarily something that you would do immediately, but that's something I think is a good idea in the long run. Um, so right now what we're doing is we're basically drawing the UI directly based on the underlying data, right? We just loop through the data and we draw the boxes on the screen based on the data, which is a fine visualization for the data. For the UI, this might be a bit difficult because, um, well, you might want to draw other elements of the UI that is not necessarily based on the data. And so then like making parts of the UI based on the data and parts of the UI not based on data. It's kind of like uh, the, the, the ways through which things land on the screen are not unified and therefore you would have to add like a lot of exceptions when you start moving through the cursor, you know, having a cursor move around on the screen, interacting with the different elements because each element is generated differently, right? So it would be nice to maybe unify this whole system of how we're making, you know, those boxes on the screen appear. So it's not just based on data, but maybe there's like a step in between there, okay? So this is the idea. This is my general idea. Let me, let me, let me show you what, what I have in mind. Let me quote this out real quick. Oh. Something like this. Something like this, okay, I quoted this out, okay? So let me, let's just, let's just assume that we have a, a, array called menu and that array will contain objects and each object will be a little box, a little box of Rooney. All right? And this array menu is going to be even like a two-dimensional array, which makes it even weirder. Um, the reason why it's two-dimensional is 
I'm going to use the cursor keys to, to grow, go through the different menu uh, UI elements. I want to be able to press cursor keys and blah, 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 go through there. And cursor keys kind of like imply a two-dimensional uh, relationship, right? It implies that there, we're going to go up, down, left, right. That's two dimensions. Um, so two-dimensional array. And then within that two-dimensional array, this left third dimension, so to speak, there's going to be like a little object. And that object will kind of like there's going to be a text. Hello. And then we can come come up with other elements, up, up, you know, ideas of what, what these little objects can do. Uh, but for now, maybe um, uh, there's going to be a text. We could, um, I don't know if that's a good idea, but maybe it is, right? We might um, put an X position. We might put a Y position, you know, so we can place the elements so the elements themselves know where they're supposed to be. Um, and maybe also something that would be good here is to do like a CMD, like a command. Just, you know, <laughs> say hello. Uh, just like uh, what happens when you interact with this element, you know? So something like this, and this should render a little box. And now what we do is we're gonna do kind of like a very similar thing that we did here, basically the same thing. Basically the same thing. Uh, except we're not taking the data. We are using this menu And then here, based on this menu, we're gonna print the information that we have from this menu, from this intermediate menu array. So we're gonna do something like local my m my m n u equals uh, menu i j. So we're grabbing that element from this two-dimensional menu array. We're grabbing the object, and then uh, we're printing. Uh, .txt, we're printing the text and we're printing it and then we don't have to care about the position. We're going to calculate the position somewhere else. We're just going to go my menu x, my menu y, and that's it. Um, the colors, again, we could maybe specify also the color of the different things, but I'm going to be blurry, um, very consistent here and I'm just going to print the text in, the, in this 13 color. I like the 13 color. That's, I think, my favorite color from the from the color palette. Uh, there's a problem here. There's a comma missing. Okay, so now we have a little hello box. Ha-ha! <laughs> um, and, okay, so wait, why, why do we have this? Well, maybe um, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna maybe create like a function that generates a whole bunch of boxes that allows us to, in, you know, interact with stuff. Okay, so let me show you how this works. So let me um, something, do something like um, refresh table. Refresh, update, maybe update. No, update is something that we already have. Um, we could also generate table. Let's, let's just call it refresh table. Um, and then it's gonna be like a separate, uh, do we put it in draw or update? Let's put it in uh, draw. It doesn't belong in either really well, but but I just want to have it here so we can build it. And this stuff, this when we generate the menu, this goes here. Because, you know, most of the time we don't actually have to touch, we don't have to actually touch this menu uh, array. We, most of the time the UI won't change, really. We're just going to navigate through and only if we actually edit data that is underlying or we click on something or I don't know. Only then the menu actually changes. So most of the time it actually, we don't have to generate it every single frame. Not that, you know, that we have like some kind of bottleneck, some kind of resource bottleneck, but you know, just like to, to give you an idea. Okay, so I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna comment this out. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna actually use this code that we have here where we're going through the data. We're gonna use that very same code. And from that data, we're gonna generate our, our different objects for the menu, right? So we're gonna go menu equals, uh, uh, yeah, like this, right? Yeah, like this. And then here, we're gonna go like something like local L and E line equals uh, this. And then, because we're going like through the data line by line, and then we're iterating through every element in that line, right? So here's we're going to create like an empty object for the line that we're um, generating. And after we do our stuff, we're then going to add that line to our menu. So we're going to go add menu 
ln e, right? Right, so here is where we are lo looping through the lines and here where we are lo looping through the individual uh, elements, individual cells in each line. So here we can do something like add ln e and then here is where we generate the menu object. I know this seems a bit weird. It does seem weird, I, I, I completely understand. So we can, we can dump the content of each data entry, each number that we have in our table, we dump that into this text variable. Um, CMD, uh, we're gonna call it something like that data. Or let's, go, let's call it edit. Um, because when I interact with each cell, I want to edit that cell. Uh, so what 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 stuff would we have? Oh, we have we have to calculate an x and y position. This is going to be, this is this is something that we have to think about. Um, uh, so previously we had like this little formula, and we're just going to copy this formula. We're going to tweak this formula in a second, but for now, I think that's fine. And that's it. Uh, we kind of try to create like an intermediate. Uh, system here where we don't just like dump the data on the screen but we take the data and create like a object structure and then that is the thing that is going to be drawn on the screen um, okay I think that's that should be it let's see if that works it works now technically just like nothing happened like we just like okay we just make that system a bit more complicated but you will see that it will, it has advantages later on down the line. It's kind of like this underlying system is very neat to have. For now, um, I want to maybe move things around a little bit. Uh, I don't like um, the placing a little bit, the placement of all this stuff. So let me tweak this a little bit. So let's go like um, minus five plus 18. Mm, yeah, even more, minus 18. Oh yeah, uh, minus 17. Uh, 16, 15, I think is a good thing. Yeah, that seems that seems like good placement. Maybe even 16, uh, 14, I mean. Yeah, that does better. And then here, let's go zero. How does zero look like bad? And minus four. Yes, I like minus four. So I'm just like making sure that everything is like moved to the left and to the uh, to the up, <laughs> to the up. <laughs> There's one thing that I don't like, uh, which is I don't like the, how the boxes are different sizes. Um, it's I mean, it makes sense because the numbers in the boxes are different numbers, um, like different lengths. Um, I want to maybe optimize this because I know that in this specific table, in this specific table that we have here, all of the boxes will be uh, three characters wide maximum. So I want to maybe optimize the, the width of the columns. So it's always, you know, ex exactly three, like each box should be three characters wide, no matter how big the number is that is inside the box. Um, something we can just do is something, put like a W, like a width variable. Uh, I'm not going to change the height. I'm just going to change the width because I don't think the height will change that much, but it might, might be nice to set up the width. Um, so let me think about the width. So that's going to be uh, each character is four pixels wide, basically. Um, so it's four uh, four times three, so that's twelve plus one for the outline. So it's I think its width is thirteen, and we're going to see if that works. Um, so now when we're printing stuff, or actually, you know what? Actually, we can just say width equals three and we can just do a double VG print that might be that might be might be simple oh, just like make it just really simple let's make it like three spaces we're gonna put three spaces in the width of variable it's a bit of a hack but whatever it's, it doesn't have to be perfect so we're just gonna print that at the same spot um, so we're just gonna pre print three spaces. See, now, now it's like these, these boxes and they're all the same size. So now um, we wanna maybe uh, tweak the gaps between the boxes a little bit. So let's go down to 16, um, 15, 14. 14 is right, yeah, that, because that's what I calculated. But now the offset here is a little bit wrong. Uh, 
Oh, still more, 10. Yeah, okay, that seems good. That seems, that seems good. And now we can bring back the actual contents of the boxes. Ah, see, now it looks a lot more regular. This is nice, this is good. This is uh, totally a hack. You could, you could also use a uh, rect fill here. Instead of the PG print, uh, use a rect fill. I just thought this was just a little bit faster. If we really need like a pixel precise scaling for, for those UI elements, we can always rewrite it a little bit. But for now, let's just move on with this. Okay, so now we have like this little system. Uh, now the next step I want to go for is I want to be able to have a cursor that moves around in our UI menu, okay? So I just like want to interact with the different elements. Let's try that. So um, for that I want to create, actually I want to have um, a variable, two variables, cursor x uh, and cursor y. Uh, remember, this, this is a cursor, uh, and this cursor, um, th this variable tells where the cursor is in the UI, not necessarily where the cursor is in the data. That's, we make a separation between UI and data, even though what we're doing right now is we have like a parity. The UI is the data right now. We don't have any additional elements. We don't have UI elements that don't correspond to some kind of data entry in our, in our uh, table, but maybe later on we will have them. Um, so right now it might be a bit, might be seem like this, this step is, makes no sense, but it will make sense. It will make sense. Don't worry. It will make sense. Um, something I want to do here is now when is, uh, yeah, so here I'm going to go if, when we're drawing the menu elements, if, uh, I equals, uh, cur y and j equals cur x, then. Uh, and then we're gonna do something like it. there's gonna be a variable called C for the color and usually the color is gonna be 13. But if the cell we're about to draw is the cell that, where the cursor is on, in these cases, we're gonna change the color to seven. And when we're printing uh, our text, uh, we're printing the text with the color C, which again, usually is 13, but for the selected menu item, it's gonna be seven. Uh, oh yeah, double equals. <laughs> See, basic mistake, I, I, I still make them. Okay, so you see now the zero up, up in the left, left corner, top left corner, that is white now because we have selected that thing now. Uh, and so now what I want to introduce is a system where we can um, use the, uh, the cursor keys, the directional keys to move that cursor, okay? And now because we did uh, like all the prep work, this is gonna be pretty easy, I think. I hope it's gonna be easy. So we're gonna go here and update table function. This function so far does nothing, but now it will start doing something. If btn p l then cur x minus equal one. And then we're just gonna repeat this three times. I'm gonna go right plus one. I'm gonna go shift r, uh, shift u for up. A y is going to be minus one, a shift D for down, Y is going to get plus one. So now we should be moving around this cursor. And we can, we can move around this cursor now. Is that neat? Look at the stuff, isn't it neat? Good, excellent. Now there's a bit of an issue here and I want to address that issue and that is you know how there's things, like things go off screen a little bit, you see? Things go off screen. I don't like how the things go off screen. Also, I can select nothing. <laughs> so I want to um, confine the cursor within the bounds of our menu system. And also I want to add a scroll variable so I can scroll through a longer table. Uh, first, let us conf do the bound confinement. Uh, so we're gonna go uh, cur x equals um, mid. Uh, we can't go lower than one uh, cur x, and then the upper bound is gonna be. Well, we're just gonna take the menu that we have. Menu uh, square brackets 
cur y. So we take the line that we are currently selecting, and we just want to make sure that we are not, we cannot select an element that is outside of the bounds of our UI, right? And actually, I want to maybe move vertically earlier than horizontally. I think that makes more sense to me. Uh, and then we're going to do the same thing with, uh, with the x value. So um, here, 1, and here, just hashtag menu, I think. Right? Just taking this menu array, checking the bounds of how many elements we have in each line and how many um, lines we have and so forth, and making sure that those cur x and cur y, cur y and cur x uh, variables that they don't, um, don't, don't assume values outside of the bounds of our array. Okay, menu doesn't exist. Um, uh, that's, that can happen um, if we uh, do an update function before we had an opportunity to refresh the table. Let me do the refresh table thing. How about if we put it here? Is that possible? Yeah. And then just make sure that we don't have any problem. We're going to go like if menu, then. So only if menu actually exists, we're going to actually draw the menu. Otherwise, we don't not drawing the menu. I know, I know it called menu, but maybe it should be like, it should be called like, UI or something, but I don't know. We menu menu we we we're stuck with menu now. Uh, okay, uh, weird, <laughs> weird things are happening. <laughs> let me let me see what that sounds, I did some mistake, Rooney. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here it has to be cur y. Somebody was screaming on the, on the screen. Uh, yeah, let's try that. Yeah, going up. I cannot go higher than the, uh, than the, the top left, the top most line. I cannot go off screen. Okay. Now, if I have uh, something that's selected as here, these are very long lines. They have like those um, those additional elements here. If I go then down, it jumps me back uh, one to the left, and now one to the left, and then now I stay here. This is good. Okay, so now we're within the bounds of our UI system. That's good. Now uh, I want to add the scroll variable. Um, I'm going to be lazy here. It's lazy desk after all. Um, I'm going to just add a vertical scroll. I'm not going to add a horizontal scroll. Uh, we don't have a situation yet where we need the horizontal scroll. In situations where we need the horizontal scroll, I will add the horizontal scroll later on if, if we ever use that. For now, I just want to just like, you know, just, just do something. Um, we're gonna call this scroll, scroll, why? Scroll it. <laughs> scroll it. Um, and then, so this is like a variable and that is gonna be something that is being added uh, when, we, when we update the menu, all right? So how are we going to do the scroll by? Well, generally, hmm. let us do a scroll Y. When we're drawing the individual menu elements, we just add the scroll Y. I think that might be, might be the easiest way to do this. And then, hmm, we're going to do something like this. Uh, we're going to take um, local my menu, we're going to take the element that's being current, currently selected. We're going to take that from that array. Cur u, cur x. We're going to take that element. Then we're going to check if that element is off screen or maybe too low, right? So we're going to go if um, my mnu dot y plus scroll scr 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 if that plus the scroll value, if that plus the scroll scroll value is greater than 120, then uh, in that case, we should we we should decrease the scroll value, right? Yeah, minus equal one. Let's try that. <gasps> it, it worked. It worked. I am a genius. I am a 
friggin' genius. <laughs> Sometimes I'm surprised. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, uh, I, I like the, that the scroll is so natural as well. That's good. I like that. Now the problem is now that going up, uh, it's not good, right? It's, you don't, you, we have to scroll in a different direction as well. So we're gonna go if, oof, if my menu plus scrolly is smaller than zero, then scrolly mm, plus equal one. Um, let's go to okay, okay, good, good. Uh, we can, we can maybe even go make it go something like 10 and then just make sure that scrolly is never positive. If um, scrolly equals um, min. Zero scroll. Yeah. Now this scrolls down. Yeah, that's good. Um, because I I just don't I wanted to scroll a little bit f before I reached the end of the screen, and uh, that's what it did. So yeah, that's good. Cool, 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 cool. We could technically. I don't know, should I do this? Let's just do this. We, we can add the horizontal scroll as well. How, because now we have the system, right? We can just add the system. So we're gonna do something like, um, when we generate our, our menus, let's just add a data entry. Uh, we're gonna go fake data entry. We're gonna go data, um, square brackets, two, equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, something like this. So very long entry here uh, in the data row two. So now we have this very, very long data entry and now we should, um, the entire screen sh sc should scroll sideways. I know I said I wouldn't do it, but I, I, I guess like now that we have it, scroll x, um, then we adding the scroll x to the position of each individual, each individual entry here as well. Scroll x, scroll x, that's good. And then again, when we're moving things around, I'm just gonna copy this entire thing and we're just gonna switch it and, and to scroll x. So again, uh, we don't need that. Uh, if menu X plus scroll X is greater than 110, then scroll X. If menu X plus scroll X is smaller than 10, scroll X and then scroll X. Oop, double L. Okay, so let's see if we just like switch it to X, if that works. Yeah. It just works. It just works. Uh, the thresholds might be adjust um, to be adjusted when you have like really big cells. Uh, we might have to adjust them, but otherwise it's it's all good. It's all good. Okay, so now we have a system that is kind of like similar to Excel, but of course one problem that we have is we cannot actually add the integer cells. So next big project is going to be um, being able to edit individual cells. There is a huge problem here, and that is. I mean, we could set it so that, you know, when you press a button, this, the number just increases and you press another button, the number decreases. That's a simple solution. And we might just like do it now to, to, to see if we can edit these things and if the export then afterward works. So let's do that. Um, something I like to do here, I think uh, it's a good idea, is inside our little, little, little object, little, little UI object to store when when you can edit this, when it's something that you can edit, to store which piece of data this cell is linked to, which piece of data is being displayed in this individual cell. 
So we don't have to do like the math and so forth, trying to figure out which cell this corresponds to. The cell itself knows which piece of data it's associated with. So something like um, cmdx equals uh, data, uh, no, just j. And cmdy equals i. j, i, like this, these are like two index indices, like the position in the cell that we are talking about, that we're taking the data information from, and we're just saving them in, a in two separate parameters of that individual cell. So we can then later retrieve it when we start interacting with the cell. Um, so uh, yeah, so these cmdx, cmdx, cmdy, and then something we can do very quickly and very simply is something like here, where we go, if btn p x, when we press the x button, then, then we're gonna, again, we're gonna grab, we're gonna grab the menu, the item that we're talking about, and we're gonna go if, my mnu, uh, mnu.cmd with the command is edit, then. So this is something that we can edit because we might have UI elements that are not about editing stuff. And then if it's not about editing stuff, then we might do something else. But for now we're editing. So we're gonna go data, square brackets, square brackets, plus equals one. We're just gonna add something. And we just have to figure out where the data is. Well, that data is, we, that's why we saved it, cmdx and cmdy. Right? We're grabbing cmdx and cmdy from the little box that we're interacting with. We're grabbing that information and we're accessing the data that is linked with that box. And we're adding one to it. And afterwards, when, after we did that, Something we have to do is we have to do a refresh, refresh table. But it's probably it will happen automatically, right? Because we do it every frame anyway. Um, yeah, equals equals edit. Okay, so now we go somewhere and we press a button. <laughs> a different cell changes. <laughs> oh no. Uh, yeah, CMD Y, CMD X. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, so now see, now this increases. We can, you can change the number now. <gasps> uh, and something that we can do now is we can uh, copy this, multiply this, and we can, um, we can <laughs> make it so that the second button, the O button also interacts with it. And we, everything will stay the same, but we decrease one, right? So now we can de increase a number for, from four, and down to four. And something I want to do is now I want to see if if uh, if this gets saved. So this was zero before. Now we're going to set it to twenty. Uh, I'm going to go export. It's exported. Now I'm going to run it again. It did not work. <laughs> why? Seriously, why? <sighs> see how we are writing it to, into this test txt file. That's not what we want to do. Now our, the name of the file that we're importing should be my shmup, uh, shmup minus uh, underscore my sbr.txt. This is the file that we should be working on. This is the file that we're importing at the beginning. So we should write into this file when we're exporting. Uh, that's why we set up this variable in the first place, right? So not writing into the test txt anymore. Now just writing into that file that we remembered. Okay, and again, I'm gonna in, in, increase it to 20. Export. Now I'm gonna rerun. And now it's still 20, yay! So now we can edit, we can edit the cells in the, our little makeshift, in our little makeshift uh, Excel. There is a problem though. There is a slight problem, and you might know where this problem is going. And that is, let's say, let's just say, I, I, I created a new sprite. And that sprite is at number 100, right? So I'm going to go like, okay, I need to change this zero into 100.
that won't cut it. That won't cut it. It just takes too long to get to a specific value that we want. Depending on what kind of data we might be editing, this might be okay for certain amount of kind of data. Not in this case. The, the, num the numbers are too big to be increasing and decreasing each number uh, like this. So it would be nice if we had a more direct way of, of getting uh, information in there. And there's, like again, lots of different ideas here. But I think for like this Excel approach here, I think it would be nice if you could just type in a number. Wouldn't be that great if we could just type in a number. But Pico 8 doesn't have a keyboard, does it? Well, it kind of does. So there is this, uh, here's this um, uh, function called stat, and the stat function is like this magical function. It, it returns all sorts of values, which are sometimes forbidden, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so yeah, there's a whole list of things that this stat function can return, depending on what kind of number you supply as the argument. Um, all sorts of very interesting things. What we're interested in is mouse and keyboard. There's raw keyboard as well, but we're not going to deal with this right now. We are interested in mouse and keyboard. I'm going to click on there, and it tells you here we have to enable some kind of dev kit mode. <laughs> it's kind of like a special mode where suddenly you have a keyboard and you have a mouse, which usually Pico 8 doesn't have. So we already know what we have to put this into our code. I'm going to, I'm going to copy this out a little bit so we can have it for later in this code. And then there's whole sorts of things. Um, this is interesting. Stat 30 will then uh, be true on frames when a key press was when somebody pressed a button. So if some, if any button was pressed, stat 30 will be true. And then stat 31 will then contain the keyboard the actual you know letter on the keyboard that has been pressed so we, we, together with stat 30 and 31 we can start polling the keyboard start looking at which keyboard has been pressed let's try that right away okay so let's go uh, first we enable the dev kit mode <laughs> like the kind of it's a cheat it's a cheat it like we basically type in an adk fa addqd you know, like typing as in, in a cheat code where we suddenly can do things that Pico 8 was, isn't supposed to do. Uh, flags? Why flags? Oh, I, th I think it's just supposed to be one, like this. Uh, let's run this. Sometimes you see like a dev kit enabled message on the bottom of the screen, but now we don't see anything. But okay, so we don't see anything, but maybe like maybe nothing happened. So definitely something happened. Look at this. We're gonna go debug one equals stat 30. Remember stat 30 was the thing like it's gonna be true when a button was pressed. Now interesting thing is that it, it turns true when I press a button, but it doesn't true false. So true means like there's a button waiting for you that you have to read out, okay? So now or something we can do something is like, um, we're gonna do if stat 30, if that's true, then debug two equals stat 31. So now we have to read out this keyboard press code and then it will turn false again. So now it's false, I press a button, it turned true quickly and then I read out the code, which in this case I pressed the D button and now, um, and now we have the D, that the D button was pressed. And now I can type in keyboards. Uh, oh, see, sometimes this, we have to deal with that later. But we, I can type in letters, and I can parse the, the letters, the, the keyboard presses that have been pressed. Nice. It's important to keep in mind that this is kind of like, again, the stat 30 will turn true and will not revert to false until you call stat 31, until you fetch the, the keyboard press. It's kind of like a weird system. And then funny enough, after you call start 31 and you get that information from stat 31, stat 31 will revert, will reset. So you cannot pull start stat 31 twice. I think it's set up in a way so you can maybe pull multiple key presses at the same time. So you, know, you would start get fetching the keyboard presses or so, so to speak, if there's multiple keyboard presses pressed at the same time. Uh, but we're not gonna deal with that right now. Just wanna make sure that this is kind of like an odd behavior happening here. So how can we now start typing now using the system? Well, something we can do here is I'm gonna set um, debug2, I'm gonna set it to, 
just like an empty string. And now here, when we're polling the individual letters from, uh, from set 31, instead of setting debug2 to set 31, we're just gonna add it. So debug2 dot dot equals. So, you know, combining two strings, whatever was in debug2, and the new button that was pressed. We're gonna combine them. Hello, this, there is no backspace. <laughs> This is dog. Old memes. <laughs> okay, so I, I know it's ba bad to read this, this debug stuff. Maybe we should have a better um, debug color. But yeah, this is generally the way which you can pull the keyboard. And we're going to deal with the enter and backspace. And also when you press P, you get the menu. These are all little things, but we're going to deal with these things later. For now, let us move on to the doggy zone. Mm -mm -mm. That's right, the dog is on. You know where this is going. That's why I, 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 I left off on this, this, this cliffhanger. I've shown you generally how to pull the keyboard. I even shown you how you can you know, type stuff. Now it's up to you. I want you to set up system where, or try to set up system where if you select a, a, a cell here and press X, it won't just increase by one, but it will start in start like a mode where you can then start typing in a number into that cell. So kind of like a full little text box. I want you to program that. That's gonna be a challenge for the dog is on. Yes, yes, yes. And also I want to say a big thank you, a huge shout out to all the beautiful people who are supporting this show and coffee. You can support this show and coffee. I already told you so many times before and I tell you again. So the URL is coffee.com slash and it's a really nice place. Some beautiful people gathered there are, are chipping in to make this show possible. Thank you so much for your support, guys. Uh, and also I would love to read out uh, a comment by one of my supporters. This one is from the Discord, but I think he doesn't mind that I, I, I just uh, talk about this here because I think it's a good question. Um, so this was posted in a secret Discord chat of the supporters. It's by Leonard Steinke and he said, I just watched episode 23 and I wanted to point out that the UFOs shouldn't move in sync with the BG due to parallax. Um, yeah, and we had like, I think in one of the episodes, I'm not sure it was 23, and we had like this phenomena where I made some mistake and then and the UFOs were moving at a different speed at the background and it kind of looked nice and I was like, ooh, I, I, I'm tempted. It's this cool effect if the UFOs are moving at a different speed than the background. Uh, I decided not to have it uh, and for like a very specific reason. Parallax is a very cool effect when it's just like some, something in the background, something that's happening, but it's just like an aesthetic choice. It can be a bit of a trick uh, or a tricky thing if that's something that is gameplay relevant because it's kind of like not really an intuitive, I feel. And especially with a shmup, like if you imagine you have the UFOs, they're moving, at a, they're moving around when you move your ship, but then you have enemies in the background as well on the ground and they also moving around, but they're moving at a different speed. I, I don't know, I'm worried that this will be just a bit confusing. And then you have to also consider that the enemies themselves shoot bullets, right? And so what are we going to do? Are all the bullets going to be on the same layer, moving at the same speed together? That would make sense. That would make it so that the patterns are nice and predictable. But it doesn't really make sense that, you know, the enemy on the ground shoots a bullet and that bullet then moves at a different parallax than the enemy that shot it. Like, it just it opens up this can of worms. Um, if you saw any shmup doing this kind of stuff, like having parallax effect with different layers of enemies, um, do let me know, because I I'm wondering if that's something that was ever attempted and if there's some, any problems out of the causes. Uh, but just like, like to make things simple, I decided not to have parallax, uh, not to have multiple parallax layers for our enemies. Right, so this is the editor, it's it's getting there, we are getting there. Uh, I have, will have to say, like, what we're attempting right now, the typing in stuff is going to be quite challenging. So I hope you join me next time around where we tackle this big challenge of typing in stuff in Pico 8. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.